Welcome to episode number 29 of the Mastering Marriage Podcast, where our goal is to strengthen, unite, and restore your marriage. And together with my husband, David, we are the co-founders of MendOurMarriage.com. And our goal is to break the back of divorce by bringing married couples together to be accountable, keep the passion alive, and expose the hidden issues that try to rip marriages apart. And we are back in the booth today with me, of course, Amanda Taylor, and my hubby, my hero, David Taylor. Hey, 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 we are back. Hey, everybody. And this is episode number 29 and uh, we just would like to say welcome. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, we have a very juicy episode lined up for you guys. You love that word, uh, juicy. Well, because this is going to be juicy. A lot of information, <laughs> a lot of just heavy stuff. Um, and so, but before we do that, I just would like to say that this podcast is brought to you on behalf of com, where our number one goal is to break the back of divorce. Snap, crackle, pop. Snap, crackle, snap. snap, snap. Oh, you can't get it out. <laughs> Couldn't get it out. But you know what I mean. We out here really trying to d- destroy divorce. And we are taking an aggressive, offensive approach. We're being proactive about it by equipping people with information, tools, and resources. One of those was the sex challenge. Yeah. Yes. yes. By now, um, it's you're going to hear this on Friday, which means that it started on Thursday. Um, so if you didn't get in, then you won't be able to get in and qualify because it was four days in four different locations. So right. everybody that will that, be a winner. Yes, and and you would have had to submit that you have joined on our website. page on the website. So if you didn't do that, then you won't qualify. But anyway, maybe next time. Yeah, maybe next time. We'll we'll be doing it. We're gonna try to do this more often because we got a really good response out of this. Yes. Maybe it was because you know it was all about sex. And people freaky, so they they like sex. Let's talk said. about sex, babe. Something, but <laughs> but anyway, um, we just want to let you guys know that we are out here really being proactive about making sure that uh, I just can't get that word out. Divorce is destroyed. That's all right. And so, um, but anyway, check out our website, mendourmarriage dot com. We have tons of resources. We have some new stuff coming out. New videos we about to drop. Uh, fitness videos, that is. And so uh, just, yeah, go and look and, and learn because we really want to educate you guys and help you, your marriage, thrive. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, uh, oh, and also before I get started, thank you, for everybody who have been submitting ratings and reviews. Yes. Keep them coming. Thank Keep them you. coming. Thank you. So, uh, but anyway, now that I've got all the formalities out the way, let's talk about today's topic. Let's go. Um, And it's really going to be focused on one area now mandy uh sent me a message a couple of days ago on facebook where she had linked me to an article that was really good and it gave, gave me a lot of insert uh insight to research and some just good information about why marriage fails and the science behind some of what makes healthy marriages thrive versus unhealthy marriages fizzle Um, So today we're going to talk about some of the science behind that, but we're going to focus on one topic, which is kindness. And if you don't know what kindness means, it just means being kind. (laughs) I know. Being nice. Being nice to each other. Thoughtful. Um, But we're going to talk about that today, and I want to talk about some science behind kindness. So I'm excited. um, It's a good article. Really good article. And so I'm going to talk, some of it is going to be a lot of science first. I'm going to tell you some research from Dr. Gottman. You guys may have remembered us talking about Dr. Gottman from episode number 12 uh, when we talked about the four things that destroy marriages. Uh, but we're going to talk a little bit more about his research. And um, so let me just jump right in. So first, let me say this. Out of every 10 marriages, only three will remain healthy and happy. So 30% of marriages remain healthy and happy. Over the span of that marriage. That's so sad. Yeah. So three out of ten. So you you guys who are listening, pick or think of ten of your friends or family members who are married. And on average, research has shown only three of those individuals 
are healthy, happy and healthy, their marriage. Mm -hmm. Which means that seven of y'all, or seven of them, are having complications that is rupturing the foundation of the marriage. Or... And they get divorced. Or they get divorced. I was going to say, and it may lead to divorce. But yeah, so so three out of ten marriages are help, happy and healthy. Seven out of ten are unhappy and unhealthy. Jeez. That's scary. We actually was part of that seven out of ten. Mm -hmm. You know, we were unhappy and unhealthy, and it almost ended in divorce. And most of the people that we work with are in that 70%. 70 um, so we're going to talk about some ways to get you to the 30%. So, um, so let's talk a little bit about the science behind why... Three out of ten marriages are happy and healthy, and the rest are unhappy. Because I, 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 that's alarming. It hurts my heart yeah. just hearing that. So let me talk a little bit about that. So so I'm going to introduce Dr. Gottman again. And you remember uh, Dr. Gottman from the Love Lab. Um, and he has a website, the, the Gottman Institute. I mean, he has been doing research for like, like 30 years or so on love and relationships. And so this guy knows his stuff. I'm actually thinking about trying to get him. No, you know what? Let's Let's be proactive. I would like to get him on the show. That's right. So I'm going to go for Dr. Godman and I'm going to go for um, Gary Chapman. Gary Chapman, yeah, to get them on the show. Because I think that uh, what we're doing and what they're doing, I think that'll be a nice, healthy uh, wow. yeah, coupling together. So, mm -hmm. But Jack, Dr. Godman, uh, he began gathering most of the critical findings in 1986 uh, when he set up the Love Lab. And uh, with his colleague, his name was Robert, Dr. Robert uh, Levinston. Uh, at the University of Washington. So so what what they did together was they brought newlyweds into the lab and watched them interact with each other. And I talked a little bit about this, but so I'm going to go a little bit deeper into what they did for this particular uh, research experiment. Uh, so for the team of researchers, what they did was they hooked up the couples to electrodes and they asked the couples to speak about their relationship, you know, like how things are going, how they met any major conflict that they're currently facing, a positive memory that they may have had. And as they spoke, the electrodes, you know, those little things that they put on your brain and on your, you know, just to kind of, yeah. The electrodes measure the subject's blood flow, their heart rate, and how much they sweat or they sweat it during the uh, process. And so then the researchers sent the couples home and followed up with them six years later to see if they were still together. So this was a long-term experiment. This mm -hmm. wasn't just a, you know, in and out, here's the data. They actually took time, six years actually, to really determine what was the validity uh, of this particular study. And so this is what they gathered from the research. Gottman separated the couples into two major groups. So, okay, you got a group of people over the course of six years. He separates them into two major groups. And so one major group is called the Masters. And the other major group is called the Disasters. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, you wouldn't want to be in that group. That, no, that's just, no. that name just tell you what's going on. <laughs> I don't so, that. But the Masters, he found, were still happily together after six years. The Disasters, of course, you can tell by the name, had either broken up or were chronically unhappy in their marriage. Ooh. Yeah. So, And this is just six years. This is just after six years. So when the researchers analyzed the data, they gathered on the couple's they saw very clear differences between the masters and the disasters. I got hype. I got. I got. <laughs> little, I got hype. You got but, loud. But so here. But but, but check good. this out. Check That's this out. Good. So the disasters during the conversation looked calm, but the physiology of their bodies that was measured by those electrodes told a completely different story. Mm. Now it's the juicy part. Yeah. Now what it what it showed was that so so just to kind of get you guys in the in the in the setting. They're strapped to the machine, and this machine is me measuring their heart rate, blood flow, breathing, all of that. Um, and on the surface, you know, the disaster group, the people that was in the disaster group, they looked really calm, cool, and collected. You know, just, just chill. You know, but after they got the data, it was a completely different st story. And what it showed was that their heart rates were quick, they, their sweat glands were active, their blood flow was fast. Right. Gottman found that the the more physiologically active the couples were in the lab, the quicker their relationship deteriorated over time. Mm. So, so, well, let me just continue to, to tell you this, because this is interesting. So pretty much if the heart rate was up, if the blood was flowing faster, if the breathing rate was faster, he was saying that pretty much they were the relationship was going to deteriorate quicker than those who actually had very stable 
readings, you know, of their physiology. And so what what does physiology have to do with anything, right? I mean, what does that have to do with marriage? What does that have to do with mm-hmm. divorce or having a happy marriage? Well, well the, here's the problem. The problem was that the disaster showed all of the sounds, signs of arousal, of being in fight or flight mode. Mm-hmm. And so anybody who have, you guys have taken science before, biology before, which is all of us, you know what fight versus flight means, right? That means that when we're in a state of where our, you know, the uh, adrenaline is rushing, heartbeat is up, we only have two reactions, either fight or flight. So if, for instance, there was a robbery in your house, mm-hmm. you would have either two rea- one, of, one of the two reactions, which is either fight or flight, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. or, and so... You know, the heartbeat is up, the adrenaline is flowing. And he said that when the disaster the disaster showed those same type of signs of being, like, attacked, of being in fight or flight mode. No and matter the conversation. No matter the conversation. And so he said having a conversation, just a simple conversation where you're sitting next to your spouse. This He was talking about the disasters. He said that just by having a simple conversation sitting with your spouse to their bodies, it was like they were facing an armed robbery. I mean, it was like... They had to protect themselves. In their minds, and their their bodies was responding to how their minds were. And their bodies were responding as if they were being attacked. Mm-hmm. Physically attacked. That's deep. That's crazy. But you wouldn't tell because on the surface they're calm and cool and collected. But on the inside, it's just a bunch of chaos going on. No true. Crazy. Crazy, crazy stuff. So, so guys, think about this for a second. So... He said he said it this way. The masters, though, on the other hand, showed low physiology or physiological arousal, which means they they felt more calm and connected together when they were conversing. And pretty much that translated to them having a warm and affectionate behavior towards their spouse, even when they fought. So even when there was conflict, they still had a very stable like physiological effect or response to what was going on, to the stimulus. But the... The the disaster group, those were the ones that were just spiking off of the meter, mm-hmm. just going haywire, crazy, crazy stuff. Mm-hmm. And so, and this was and this was interesting because he said it didn't it didn't necessarily have to be a conflict that they were having for the disasters. Mm-hmm. They could just be talking about everyday conversation, but they already positioned themselves on the defense. So it seemed like those people were really used to all of them, pretty much all of their interactions being hostile. Yeah, yeah, for the most part. Yeah, yeah. And, and he, what he was saying is, it's not that the masters had a better physiological makeup than the disaster group of people. It's just that the masters had created a climate of trust and intimacy that made mm. both of them more emotionally and thus physically comfortable. And I know it goes back to what we've talked about before, you know, creating a climate or an environment in your home that's conducive for a healthy marriage. Mm-hmm. And what he was saying was that the masters or the group of individuals in the master category, that that's what they did. They created an environment that was conducive for a calm, cool, and collected response. And so Gottman wanted to know more about how the masters created this culture of love and intimacy. And so he did a follow-up study uh, in 1990 because he wanted to know what was the difference between the disasters and the masters. What Why was... One group having success while the other group was struggling. You know, why, why was on the inside the disasters feeling attacked while the masters were calm, cool, and collected? So in 1990, he did another study. Um, and he designed a lab on the University of Washington's campus to look like a beautiful bed and, bref- bed and breakfast retreat. That sounds like something fun to go to, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and he invited 130 newlyweds, uh, couples, to spend the day at the retreat. And he watched, he watched them as they did their normal things that people do on vacation. You know, cook, clean, listen to music, talk, relax, hang out. Uh, and God, Gottman made a very critical discovery. This was this this is where it gets juicy, y'all. Mm-hmm. You know, he made a nice discovery in this study, and one that gets to the heart of why some relationships thrive and some relationships fizzle. So this is the part where you guys want to take notes. So he noticed that throughout the day. Partners would make requests for connection. And Gottman called these requests bids, right? B-I-D-S, bids. Kind of like you put a bid in for, you know, a new house or something like that. That's what he, he said whenever a partner made a request, he was calling that request a bid. So, for example, let's say there was a husband 
you know, that likes birds. And he's an enthusiast. He loves birds. And he notices, let's say he's out there watching, and he noticed a, you know, a, I don't know, a blue jay. And he says, oh, bae. You know, that's what he called his wife, bae. <laughs> he said, oh, bae, you know, come look at this beautiful bird that I saw outside. And what Gottman said was that this the husband is not just commenting on the bird. He's requesting a response from his wife. Mm-hmm. Now, on the surface, it may seem like he's just kind of saying, oh, look at this beautiful bird. You know, because he likes birds. But what got me noticed was that he's really making a request. And he's requesting a certain response from his wife. Mm -hmm. And what he's looking for was a sign of interest or support. Mm -hmm. And and, and really on a deeper level, he's hoping that they'll connect. uh, And even if it's just over the bird, share a moment. Share a moment of connection. Mm -hmm. And so... What Godman said was that the wife has a choice in this in this moment, this situation. The wife has a choice. She can respond by either turning toward her spouse mm. or turning away from her spouse, as Godman puts it. Mm-hmm. And through the bird bit, might seem kind of like minor and silly. What it meant was that it actually revealed a lot about the health of the relationship. And here's some of the science. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, some of the science on this part. The husband thought that the bird was important enough to to bring it up in conversation. And the question is whether his wife recognized and respects that. Mm-hmm. So I want everybody to be thinking about a time when you have made a bid towards your spouse. You know, you had maybe suggested something or commented on something, and that was a verbal bid that you had given towards your, towards your spouse. Mm-hmm. And I want you, as the spouse, as the receiver, I want you to think about how you responded. Did you turn towards your spouse and show interest? Or did you turn away from your spouse mm-hmm. and not show interest? And here's what Gottman, Dr. Gottman found. People who turned towards their partners in the study responded by engaging the bidder, showing interest and supporting the bid. Those who didn't, those who turned away from their spouse, would not respond or they would respond minimally and continue doing whatever they were doing, like watching TV or reading the paper uh, and sometimes they will respond with like very hostile, a hostile demeanor. Mm-hmm. Like, can you stop interrupting me? I'm trying to watch the mm-hmm. show or I'm reading here. So can you leave me alone, please? Or even mocking. Yeah. That's another example. Yeah. Making yeah. fun of. Making fun like, of. That's stupid. Yeah. Why, why would this just a bird? Come on now. Like, yeah. get focused. Mm-hmm. So these biddings, these interactions have profound effects on the marital well-being. So here's the numbers, guys. You're going to be blown away way by the statistics. Couples who had divorced after six years of the follow-up, you know, the six-year uh, research, had turned toward their partner or had turned toward bids only 33% of the time. So that means only three in 10 or three out of 10 bids for emotional connection, connection were met with intimacy. Mm. So that's like you giving me a bid 10 times and I only respond three times which I know I've been guilty of back in the past. I, I already know. I was reading this like, oh, I know I didn't did this. I didn't did this. <laughs> I think that's why it resonated with me because I was like, oh, my goodness. I know exactly. Yeah. I felt crazy this before. Crazy. I've been there. And then he said only, he said the couples who were still together after six years had a turn toward bid rate of 87%, which meant that pretty much nine out of ten of those opportunities they were meeting the partner's emotional needs. So that's huge. Yeah, yeah, because what this means is that if like there's a highly a high likelihood that your marriage will end in divorce if you aren't responding to your spouse when they give you a bid. Right, in a positive manner. In a positive manner. Oh, yeah. Kindness. Yeah. yeah. But if you are responding in that way, nine out of ten of the times, your marriage is gonna be good. It's gonna be copacetic. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, you, I mean, this is it's night and day. The research is night and day. Like, so that's what he said. After after six years, if they were still together, that meant that out of nine out of ten times they were responding and meeting their partner's emotional mm-hmm. needs. So it's very crucial that you focus on the emotional needs of your partner. We know this. We, I mean, we preach this and we, we I mean, everybody knows it, but nobody does it. Mm-hmm. Or very few people do it. I put it like that. People get comfortable. We get very comfortable. Well, now, when we're dating, we meet your emotional needs because oh, we want to get you. We want to get you. And out of 10. But when we, once we cop that. No chill. Once we tap that, <laughs> it's a wrap. I'm just saying. I'm being honest. I'm just being honest. I'm going to put it out there. Once it, once all that is already in the bucket and we didn't got you, 
We ain't really focused on meeting your emotional needs. We focus on you meeting our emotional needs. I, yeah, I, don't, I don't think you got that. You missed it. You missed it. I said, we're not focusing on meeting your emotional needs. We're focusing on you meeting our emotional needs. Mm-hmm. So the focus shifts from me helping you to you helping me. Mm-hmm. What can I get out of this bargain? That's so true. Yeah. So, and, and he said that, so for the masters, there's a habit in mind that the masters have. And Gottman explained it this way. And this is a quote. This is what Gottman says. He says that the masters, they're scanning their social environment for things that they can appreciate and say thank you for. They are building the culture of respect and appreciation very intentionally or on purpose. Mm -hmm. And then he says disasters are scanning the social environment for the mistakes that the partners are making. This is deep. (laughs) Because that was like, yeah, this was that was me. Like looking for mistakes. And I didn't do it on purpose. It just became part of my outlook is, okay, what is she not doing right so that I can tell her to do it right so that I can be happy? I remember that. And that was a lot of part of, you know, me moving towards divorce when we had our issues was what is she not doing right? What is she doing that's making me not happy with her? And, mm-hmm. it, it, yeah, it just, it's, just right yeah, now. yeah. And so he says, and this is, so his wife, you know, who's part of the study also said this. She said it's not just scanning the environment. It's scanning the partner for what the partner is doing right or scanning him or her for what he's doing wrong and criticizing versus respecting him and expressing appreciation. Mandy got her arms up. <laughs> you want to preach for a second? Woo! That is so critical. Yeah. yeah. You know, how you respond and how you approach each other is so critical. It. Especially for those of you who are more um, more strong willed and more opinionated, yeah, you really have to bring in the reins with that, yeah, and you have to start to again look for the best, believe the best in yeah. your spouse. Yeah. I'm not saying don't ever say anything about what's going on, but it's how you say it. Yeah, you know, are you being kind? Yeah. Well, we're not, well, well, because think about this. Remember in episode 12 when we talked about the four horsemen. And so for you guys that don't remember the four horsemen um, to, you know, failed marriages, go back and listen to episode number 12. We talk a lot about the research that Dr. Gottman has done on that area. And it's really good stuff, really good stuff. Uh, But what Mandy is saying is that a lot of times, like criticism and contempt, they're extremely detrimental to the foundation of the marriage. And often, I know I was guilty of this, is I was a very critical spouse. Like I was, once I read this, it made much more sense that I wasn't just scanning the environment, like looking at the house and the walls, but I was also looking at my wife, looking at, and I was, but it goes deeper for me because I was actually comparing the current Mandy to the Mandy that I met when I first, the the Mandy that I met when we first started dating. I was comparing the two. And I was saying that the Mandy that I had started to like was different than the mar- the Mandy that I had married. And I was very critical on the Mandy that I had married because I didn't take into consideration that people change. And I also didn't take into consideration how much damage I had actually done on Mandy's self-esteem because of my approach, of my critical approach. you know. And so wives, husbands, those who are hypercritical or hyper-vocal about how things are in the marriage. Be careful, because if you're criticizing, you're only driving a deeper wedge. What do you think, baby? Whew. I'm just sitting here like, thank you, Jesus, <laughs> for revelation. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I, I totally concur and agree. You know, um, the way we approach each other should be in love. Mm-hmm. And I always say, we, if the more we study love and we understand the attributes of love, and, you know, believing the best of each other yeah. and believing that, hey, we're on the same team. Yeah. So if I love you and I've trusted you with my heart to join you in, in holy matrimony, I should believe that when you're doing things, you're doing them not to hurt me. Mm-hmm. But, you know, you're doing those things because maybe it's a learned behavior. Maybe yeah. it's how you communicate. and. That's why we have to become students of our spouses. Yes, we do. We got to become students of our spouse. And this is, as I was studying Mandy during our dark season, this is what I learned about Mandy. This is, and I had to be honest with myself because I was like, what was the reason why I decided to come back into to our relationship? 
And it factored down to this. Mandy, even when I was distant and not emotionally there for her or physically there for her, Mandy remained kind towards me. She remained absolutely kind. And it blew my mind so much so that it caused me to gravitate back towards her. And actually, in this, in this corresponds with research, because research actually says this. It sh- it research shows that along with emotional stability, kindness is the most important predictor of satisfaction and stability in a marriage. So if there's kindness and emotional stability, that's the most important predictor of whether or not your marriage is going to be satisfactory and stable over the long haul. And it was Mandy's kindness that took it over for me because no matter how cold I was towards her she did not become angry towards me she did not and to this day I'm still amazed at how she was able to do that because at some points I was a jerk you know I was very I would reject my wife and you know and I still wanted my cake yeah I was like whatever you know and she still made my tea still did the laundry I mean it was babe you was you was you you did your thing because I had to stay consistent in my study of love, and and I had to make sure I had a right a right perspective yeah. of the situation. Yeah. I, I had to be better when you were at your worst. Yeah, you and know? that she was. And and I had to put my desires and my feelings aside for a season, and and stand in that strong position so that our marriage could be restored and and you know revived for a lifetime. Yeah, and, and now and, and it's good because let me well let me say it this way, most people. Would if I was to go up and say, do you do you consider yourself a kind person? You know, are you a kind person to strangers? Most people would say they are, but then when I say, are you kind to your spouse? Are you would your spouse say that you are a kind person? We probably would get a completely different answer. Mm-hmm. And so I want you to think of kindness as a muscle. Mm-hmm. It's not just a uh, a static thing that's just either you have it or you don't. Mm-hmm. It is actually something that can grow with exercise. It's like a muscle. So the more you practice kindness, the better at it you'll get. And what Manny was saying is that she had to become love, which meant that she had to literally practice the definitions of love. If you look at the Bible, long-suffering, gentleness, you know, like not... Believing the best. Yeah, believing in the best. Not holding me hostage for my past behavior. Mm -hmm. All that kind of comes to me off as kindness. And she had to put all that behind me, all my issues behind me, and still see me as the leader of our household, which I still don't know how she do. Like, I would have, I would have lost respect for me if I was you, but you didn't. And I, I'm, I'm confused, and I often ask you, like, where did all this anger go? Because I'm like, I would have been, I would have disrespected me so bad. <laughs> but Mandy did not disrespect me at, at, at it all. It was because of my positioning. You know, I always go back here, but this is my foundation. God was my foundation. I stuck very close to him. I mm. I honestly, until that's, until we had our dark season, I didn't realize that I really didn't depend on God like I thought. Mm. And I had to, re, I had to refocus. Yeah. And, and I had to make God my foundation. Yeah. And um, like I said, studying love and staying saturated in that. Yeah. Not just read the scripture in the morning and then just go about my she whole She had to immerse day. herself. I had to immerse myself. I had to record to immerse myself. Yourself. <laughs> immerse yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I mean, and just recently I even let David hear of some of the voice recordings I put on my phone. I let him hear one of them. And this was back from a while ago. She was affirming me. I was saying when affirmation. I was wanting to be out of the marriage. Yes. So she, basically what was I was crazy. doing. I recorded myself speaking life into him. So I was speaking the opposite of what, of what he was putting out because I knew who he was. I knew who he was purposed to be because I took time to study my spouse, Mm. even even though he wasn't being that man as of that day. But I recorded myself. I have those recordings still of, of me just declaring greatness over him, even though we were in a dark season, even though she was hurting and angry and sad and depressed crazy so 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 the moral of this story is depression sadness none of that is an excuse for you not to stay and fight Mm -hmm. because if mandy can do it i know anybody else can do it because mandy is just a regular human being just like the rest of us i know that's right you know and just have to 
Faith without works is dead, is what I always say. Yeah. So you pray and you get before God, but then you have to put the work, put the work in. in. You have to yeah. become disciplined in yeah. these things and immerse yourself yeah. in the study of love. And so so just for, so to, in this episode, I wanted to just give you some science behind what really works with marriage and what really makes marriage work. Mm-hmm. And so what we found out was that when you when your partner makes a bid and you turn towards your spouse, you do a positive response and you engage yourself in what they're interested in, you have a higher rate of success in your marriage. No matter how big or small. No matter how big or small. And I think it also said in the article, just real quick, even when you don't feel like it, Mm -hmm. you know, as David said, kindness, think of it as a muscle. Mm -hmm. Okay, so even when you don't feel like it, just even a slight response, just even showing that you care or showing interest, you know, just even in the slightest bit is turning towards instead of yeah. you just saying, leave me alone. I have a headache and turning over or having an attitude or something like that. Stand on your phone while your partner gives you a bid, mm-hmm. you know, or having your phone in your hand when your partner gives you a bid. Mm-hmm. And this is something me and Mandy actually called each other out on the other day is because yeah. we were watching TV <laughs> and, and then we was talking and I was like, babe. You, do you notice that you have your phone in your hand and you're looking on your computer screen mm-hmm. while we're talking? And we're both so used to we're doing that. We're both so used to doing that. Because we have so many things going on. I mean, on. this chick had her phone in her hand while she was looking at her computer. And she was looking at the computer while and she was, was talking saying, to me. Mm-hmm, with and the talking TV at on. the same time. <laughs> I mean, we were just so disjointed. And I was like, okay, yeah, we got to, when we do this, oh, we want to give some focus, undivided attention. Okay. Even though we both weren't doing this and distracting the other person or like trying not to look at the other person. Yeah. It's just better to give that focus. Definitely. Attention, you know, so turn towards your spouse. When they give you a bid, turn towards them. Mm-hmm. Don't, you know, don't turn away or show disinterest. And then also make sure that you practice kindness. So mm-hmm. here's your homework. I want you today to practice three random acts of kindness for your spouse. So today do three random ca- acts of kindness. I snapped a little bit, but I ain't going to edit that out because it's all real. We, we grind me up in here. <laughs> Three random acts of kindness for your spouse. Okay? Three random acts. So these are acts that you would not normally do. So don't, if you make tea every day, that's not your random act of kindness. I need your tail to do something Can different. Can make coffee instead? <laughs> something. But just make sure that it's, it's new and it's random and do three. Mm-hmm. And these are all tools that you can use to help strengthen your marriage Mm -hmm. okay point blank simple anything else you want to add to that baby i think we got it all right so so if you need to listen to this again to take some notes please do um i'm planning on doing a blog post about this information as well because this is so juicy and there's there's more to it Mm -hmm. this was just half of the article by the way you can't deny it yeah it's it's research yeah you know proven it's proven love, yeah. and then you have the scripture tells you to love, so yeah. I don't know how you can beat that. Yeah, yeah. And all we got to do is now just be doers, right? Yes. Be doers of the word. Yes. Pre- amen. 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 I don't know about what they did, <laughs> but amen. But anyway, guys, we appreciate your time. We appreciate your sacrifice. We appreciate your ear. We sure do. Yes. I mean, we're going over 30 minutes, so I'm about to end the podcast, but we, I just want to say thank you again because, you know, we, we wouldn't be able to do this without your assistance and your support. Um, and so keep the questions coming. We have not stopped. We just tried to do something a little different, switch it up a little bit. Uh, but keep the questions coming mm-hmm. because on Monday we're going to announce who's the winner of the sex challenge. Hope y'all getting y'all groove on. Me and Mandy about to get ours on. I'm just, wow. I'm, I'm just saying we married. We can do that. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, leave a rating and review, guys, okay? We need them. Because the more rating and reviews we get, the more visual or, I guess, visible we are to our listeners. That's right. So please submit some more in iTunes um, so we can get back into the top ten. And hopefully into the top four and then into the top spot. But we got some work to do. So anyway, we thank you guys. We appreciate your time. And we are out. Deuces. Deuces.